Well, as you just heard, we are entering into a new theme here, and we're thinking about the church as the sent people of God. And uh, it's an exciting theme. It's an exciting moment in the life of, of our church. Um, you just saw Ian on the video screen there. In case you don't know who he is, Ian has been on staff here at the church for, uh, I think, about four years. Uh, I've only been on staff for like nine months, so I can't remember how long. Everybody seems like they've been here forever. Um, but uh, he uh, <clears throat> responded to a call from the session that actually began in some ways 25 years ago when people started sensing that God wanted Central to, to contribute to the kingdom, to be a part of his work in the world by planting a church. And so uh, that is about to happen as, as Ian and Jill have responded to that call and are ready to lead that initiative. Um, you may also know about Ian and Jill that they uh, just had a baby, so they're apparently so unfazed with uh, that challenge that they're, re- they're looking for a new one, <laughs> which is pretty impressive. I went to see baby Isla last Sunday, and uh, she is adorable. She is so cute. Um, even when she uh, filled her diaper, the moment I held her, with great volume and enthusiasm, um, she was still cute. I took it as a sign that we had a good connection, actually. And she's really cute, even though, this is going to come as a disappointment to some of you, I think she looks a lot like Ian. <laughs> I know many of you were praying for a different direction, but, but she, she is very cute. Um, and what it made me realize is, actually, uh, this must mean that underneath that beard, uh, Ian actually looks like a really cute little baby girl, <laughs> which I didn't see coming, but it must be true. We're excited for this new chapter, Um, but it's a big moment, and because it's a big moment, it's also, uh, there are other emotions that are probably going on, but we might be a little nervous, we might be a little sad, and so we think it's because of the the moment, the bigness of this moment, we want to take time to think about what it means to be the church at all, whether we're a, a, a church that is beginning in Charles Village in 20. 16, or whether we're a part of a church that began as a church plant in 1853, which is central, in case you're wondering. Some of us are going to, are are probably thinking right now, trying to determine whether God is calling us to be a part of this church plant in Charles Village. And we're hoping that, we're praying that um, above the, of the about a thousand people who kind of come here and consider this their church home, that like 40 or 50 of you are going to do that, are going to leave us and go to be a part of this new work that God is doing. Um, And so we hope that, as Ian mentioned, that we'll be able to sort of give some clarity to what that means uh, over the course of this sermon series and help you in that discernment. But it's also true that most of us are going to stay here. And so we want to think about these things because we have an opportunity um, as central to reclaim and re-understand and recommit ourselves to this mission that God has sent us on um, of being the sent people of God where we are. Some of you, it might be your first time uh, being at this church or in any church, and so you might be thinking, well, this sounds like inside baseball. What's this going to be like for me? Well, I hope that for you, what, what will be painted is a picture of what God intends For his community. We all know that the picture of the church that comes into our minds uh, is not always a pretty one, and our experiences of the church have not always been pretty ones. So we want to look at scripture to see what God, God's original intentions for this people of God, uh, what it looks like. And so our hope is that this picture will be compelling and be one that we want to be a part of, whether it's Charles Village or Towson or wherever God is sending us. So, where do we begin? If we're thinking about who is the church supposed to be, where do we begin to look? There's a number of places we could look. We could look at the history of Central Presbyterian Church, which was started in Baltimore in 1853, and then was kind of relocated out here after it almost died, and was closed and replanted by a would-be Chinese missionary. That could be something that we could gain some insight from. But we could also go back further. We could go back to the sort of 
founding of the Presbyterian Church and talk about John Calvin and the Reformation when the church was really conceived of as a place where the word was rightly preached and the sacraments were rightly administered. We could learn a lot from that, but we could also go back even further to the early church or the book of Acts where the disciples were um, committed to one another. They held all things in common. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the breaking of bread and fellowship and to prayer. But we might want to go back to Jesus himself and this group of 12 working class disciples who he called to follow him and join with him in this mission of preaching and healing and teaching. But I actually think the story begins even before that. It actually begins in this little town called Haran, which is now would be near the border of what is Turkey and Syria, with this ancient Mesopotamian chieftain whose name was Abram, who was minding his own business when God spoke to him. And that's what we're going to read about right now in Genesis chapter 12, which if you want to pull out the Bibles in front of you, it's on page 10, so that's pretty easy to find. Let's take a minute to pray and ask God to help us hear him as we read his word. Father, thank you for being a God who wants to speak to us, who has um, a word for us and work for us, and I pray that as we read this ancient text that you'd bring it to life for us in a new way. Um, Bring it to life for us as a corporate body of people, but bring it to life for us as individuals as well. Um, Speak to us just as you spoke to Abram. Call us just as you called Abram. Send us just as you sent Abram. Thank you that because of Jesus Christ, we've been welcomed into that family. And um, so these blessings and promises are ours as well. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Genesis 12, verse 1 starts this way. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. We're on page 10 of the Bible, but uh, a lot has happened since page 1. Page 1 is when God um, page one is when God creates the world and the universe and everything seen and unseen, and then speaks words of blessing over that world. He says, "It is good." It is good, and when it's completed, it is very good. But it does not take long for things to turn south. Um, Within 10 pages, we've gone from it is very good to brothers killing each other in chapter 4 with Cain and Abel to uh, natural catastrophe in Genesis 6 with Noah and the flood to in Genesis 11, In the Tower of Babel, we have a global ethnic and cultural division. So what God began as very good has descended into something very bad, uh, quicker than milk that you leave out on the shelf, or Mumford & Sons musical career after that last album, (laughs) or the Ravens' playoffs hope, hopes maybe? Ooh, Mm mm-hmm. See, this is what I'm talking about, conflict division. (laughs) So things have have gotten bad, and the Bible in those first nine pages has put forward a picture of the sort of comprehensive mess that human self-centeredness and sin has introduced into the good creation of God. It is under a curse. The world that had been spoken into creation and then blessed is now fallen. So what will God do? What is God's response? Well, the verses we have just read can be thought of as the beginning of God's answer to the mess of the world. In fact, these verses are so important that John Stott has said that uh, the whole of God's promises are encapsulated in them. 
that they are some of the most expansive verses in all of Scripture. And Paul, in the book of Galatians, says that these verses we just read can be thought of as the gospel in advance. And so here we have God's answer to the problem of human division, um, lostness in sin, rebellion against God. He begins by calling this man to go from the place that he knows to a place that he doesn't know. Which doesn't at first seem like it's going to solve the problem. (laughs) Unless you realize that God can work enormous results out of very, very small beginnings. Last week at the men's retreat, we were um, up in the woods and we were looking at acorns. We were considering the amazing reality of an acorn. This little one is one that I picked up in my yard yesterday. And this little seed contains within it all the information necessary to develop into a, an amazingly complex living being that can stand for centuries and then can let all of its leaves go on my yard in a couple of weeks. But what we have in these passages, or what we have in, a, in, a, in an acorn, is a kind of an oak tree in advance. It's got the DNA that will characterize the growth and development, um, if all goes well, with the, with the little seed, so that it can become an oak tree. And in the same way, I think these verses here are a kind of seed of the gospel itself. That what we see in these verses are ingredients that will remain the case for the people of God as Abram goes and as his family grows and becomes the people of Israel. And as that story continues, we have some essential ingredients that we have in this passage. So what are those? Well, I think that there are three themes that kind of interweave and lead into one another in the passage we've just read, and those are Um, going and trusting and blessing. The going is an invitation to trust, and surrounding that invitation to go and trust are promises of blessing. So this is what I want us to look at as as we think about what it means to be the people of God at all. So the first thing we see is that Abram is called to go, to go from his father's household and his people and his land to a land that God will show him. Now, this is a remarkable request um, made before the days of Google Maps and uh, series directions. Uh, Abraham is called to go from everything that he knows. And in that time, uh, your family, your father's household, your land was what defined your identity. It's what made you who you are. So it's a remarkable thing that God is calling him to do. It's a remarkable task that he's sending him to go from everything he knows, everything that makes him who he is, to somewhere else. And he doesn't even tell him where he's going. He says, go from everything you know to a place that I will show you. So the first ingredient of the people of God we see is this invitation to step out in faith in risk, and in sacrifice. Part of the reason God calls us to do this is because when we do that, when we leave the things we know and what is familiar to us, we're putting ourselves out in the territory of trust, in the kind of landscape of faith. It's not, it's so much more difficult to trust God when we think we have all of our ducks in a row and we understand who the society tells us we are and who our country and culture tell us we are. But when we step out following God, we have to rely on him in a way that we don't at home. But not only is he calling Abram to to leave what he knows, but he's also calling him to trust him for the destination. Because as we mentioned, he doesn't tell him where he's going. He says, I'm going to show you that land, which means that God is on the move with Abram. Actually, God is on the move before Abram. He knows where he's going, he knows where that land is, and he knows 
the way to get there. And so this invitation or command to go has within it, hidden within it, an invitation to trust. It's risky, it involves sacrifice, it can be a little scary, but that's what it is to follow God. That's what it means to trust. And the only thing scarier than the people of God on the move with God is a people of God standing still. I think any time that we encounter a, ch- a church that um, is corrupted by power or consumed with conflict or just kind of enamored with its stained glass windows and its social status, what we find is a church that has stopped looking upward and outward to what God is calling it to and become cozy and comfortable with the way things are. It's a little bit like riding a bicycle. And this is, uh, I'm in a bicycle riding training period of life, and uh, I've been trying to communicate this without great success to my current bicycle student. The bike only works when it's moving, right? If you are not moving, you are not going to stay balanced on the bicycle. If you're just standing there precariously, afraid to move, that's when you fall. It's when you're in motion that you get your balance, that you get moving, that the bicycle works the way it's supposed to. And I think that's how life with God is as well. It doesn't work the way it's supposed to when we just stay where we are. It's when we are in motion with God on his mission of reconciling the world to himself that we find our equilibrium and our balance. It only works when it's in motion. So God calls Abram to leave behind what he knows, go forward into what he does not know, and find there a a God who can be trusted. You know that he wants uh, Abram to find him because of these enormous promises of blessing that come along the way. There's one thing that Abram is called to do, and that is to go. And God promises in three verses five different kinds of blessing. He says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your family that comes after you. I'm going to bless the people who bless your family. And then ultimately, I'm going to bless all the peoples of the earth through that blessing. So, in a way, he's, he's inviting, if we think about these individually, he promises to bless Abram. He promises that Abram will experience that favor that has been lost in creation because of human frailty and fallenness. He promises that he will, in a way, embody that blessing, that his family will be newly defined, not by father's house and land and um, things that have been known, but, but instead being defined by this favor of God. It will reconstitute them in a way. They will be a blessing. Not just blessed, but it will define their whole identity. And then, of course, the end game is not that this blessing would just rest with Abram and his family, but that through that blessing to Abram and his family, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. And in this way, that curse that human beings have brought upon the creation of God, which was very good, is going to be undone, and God will say again, God will bring again blessing into that world, doing it through the human beings who have caused the problem. This is the mission of God, to experience and embody and extend the favor of God in a world that has fallen from him. So, if this is the plan, what it means to be the people of God is that we are all sent. We are all invited to go from what we know, stepping out in trust with a God who is on the move, and trusting that in that going and trusting, we will experience his favor in a way 
that we can't if we remain where we are. This is how God is reconciling the world to himself, by calling out a people and sending them on this mission. So the question is, how does it work out? Spoiler alert, not so good. The Bible is in one way, one long story of human failure and unwillingness to go and trust and bless. We don't want to go, we'd much rather stay where things are known. We don't want to trust, we want to know. And we don't want to be a blessing so much as we just want blessing. That is what defines our human response so often to this calling of God. So we fail over and over again throughout the Bible as Abraham's family grows This story just repeats itself over and over again of a failure of experiencing God's favor fully and embodying it as we should and extending it to all the peoples of the world. Instead, we find ourselves longing for a true experience of God, the experience that can only be found on the move with God. We want to experience that blessing, but we fail. And so we cannot, we do not extend it. Whether it's Abraham or his son Isaac or his son Jacob or the people who become the nation of Israel, this plan seems to not be working. But this God who sent Abram is not done sending. He goes on to send into that family his own son. But what's amazing about this is that we see that the mission that is outlined in Genesis 12 really doesn't change. Because God sends his own son from his father's household, from a true and perfect experience of God's favor, and he sends him out on a risky sacrificial mission to a far country. And as Jesus goes in trust on that mission, he actually embodies God's favor in a way that no one else ever did or could. So he experiences God's favor, he goes in faith, he trusts, he embodies that, and so then he is the one who extends that blessing to all the peoples of the earth. And he he throws open the door of that family from being just the people of Israel to now people from every language, tribe, and tongue are invited in through Jesus Christ to be a part of this family that has been sent on this mission. Jesus goes all the way to the cross. He trusts even when it seems like everything is lost. And so he is the one who finally extends that blessing of God and reverses that curse that we human beings have brought into the world. So this mission that is called the gospel in advance is not just a sort of list of marching orders for the church. It's not just a list of marching orders for Abram. The reason it's called the gospel in advance is because it is a definition of the mission that Jesus will fulfill on our behalf and for us. We're not just the instruments of his blessing were also the objects of his blessing. We're not just the tools that he uses, but he, we are the targets on which he sets his mercy and love and grace. And so, it's when we are a part of this mission of God that we fully and truly experience that favor. We spend so much of our time I think, driven by a longing for what is ultimately an affirmation that only God can give us. It drives us in all kinds of ways, but God offers us that blessing as we move with him on this mission of reconciling all things. And so, this invitation to be a part of Jesus' family is again, something that changes on this side of the cross in a certain way and remains the same in a certain way. 
Jesus has fulfilled this mission, but then, having sent Abram, having sent Jesus, having created this new family through the blood of the cross, God then, through Jesus, sends his Spirit. And Jesus says, as the Father sends me, so I am sending you. The mission remains the same, but now we are a part of this mission because the Spirit connects us to Jesus and makes us more like him, and Jesus' mission is fulfilling what we read in Genesis 12. And so that that mission of going and trusting and blessing, that call to experience and embody and extend the blessing of God to all peoples is something that is possible for us to experience as we experience life with Jesus, who has already accomplished it. This has some implications for us. This means that as we are close to Jesus, there are certain things that will just be natural about our lives together. It will be natural and normal that we will care about all the peoples on the earth. So it's totally natural and totally normal for churches to nurture people in such a way that they go to other countries and pour out their lives to be a blessing. We are blessed to be a blessing. And there are people in this room who are or will be hearing God send them to do exactly that. It's the most natural thing in the world for God to nurture a community and then send some of those people to create a new community of faith. Because the people of God are blessed in order to be a blessing to our neighbors. We're not to hold on to that blessing, but we're to hand it off. And some of you in this room are or will be called and sent for precisely that purpose. But what I hope you see is if, if this is what it means to be the people of God, to be sent on the mission that God is on, then it's true for all of us. Not just if we go to China or Charles Village, but we are sent to the places where we already are. If God is a God on the move, then he was ahead of us and brought us to the places we are. We don't just happen to live in Towson or Timonium or Baltimore or Rogers Forge. If we are the people of God, God has sent us there, and he is sending us there. If to be the people of God is to be sent on the mission of God, then there is no if we are sent. The only question is where and how. So as we begin asking God, what does that mean for us? We can trust that we will hear his voice calling us to go, to do something risky. Even if it's not a geographic move, it might be entering into our neighborhoods, our families, our places of work with a new sense of commitment to blessing. It might send us to the cross again and again, seeking forgiveness and grace and that experience of favor that we long for and yet lose so quickly in our own experience. And it might be a recognition that we in our life together are called to embody and reflect God's favor in our relationships with one another and our relationships in the world. Because what it means to be the people of God is to be on the move, trusting God, and blessing the world around us. Let's pray. Father, we need to experience you more deeply. We need to embody your life in flesh and blood ways together and in mission more accurately. And we want to extend that blessing and be a part of your solution to everything that's wrong in the world. We thank you that you are committed to this so much so that you shed your own blood. So as we come to the table, as we remember your broken body and your shed blood poured out for us, we ask for your blessing. And we pray, God, that you would begin to speak and stir in our hearts 
reminding us of what it is and who it is we are called to be and where it is and what it is you are sending us to do so that the blessing that we receive through Jesus Christ and at the table is one that doesn't remain with us but flows through us to our neighborhoods, to our city, to all the peoples on earth. For this is your mission, and we long to be a part of it. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.